guys. All right, let's pray together. Father, we uh, are gathered here now, and, and we come to this time where we get to look at your word and see what you would say to us. And um, Lord, be encouraged to stay the course as we've looked at the story of the last part of Paul's journey in the book of Acts throughout this summer. Would we see the conclusion, Lord, the completion of this story and see how it relates to us? Be with us, Lord, in your name. Amen. Guys, if you have a Bible, uh, you want to pull out your phone, uh, anything you have with you, we're going to be in Acts chapter 28. And before we get into the text for today, I want to kind of give you a, another overview and a reminder of why we're in this book at all and why we're here. Uh, we started out in the book of Acts um, back in January of 2015 believe it or not. And in January of 2015, we went into this book, and if you went back and you listened to those sermons, and you, uh, you would find that there's been a consistent theme that we've addressed the entire time. We've, we keep coming back to the same idea, and that is that the book of Acts really is our history, that it's really our story, that when we read it, we're not reading somebody else's story, we're reading the history of the church as it exists today, that we uh, in the 21st century, Christians in the 21st century, part of the church in the 21st century, uh, can look back on what happened in the, in the first century as the church of Jesus Christ moved from Jerusalem to Rome in a single generation, and we can discover that, that they, we serve the same God, we have the same Savior, the same Spirit, the same mission, and the same message, and because we have all of those things, we should expect similar results. And so we want to know how, what was happening in the church of the first century and how can we expect that to translate to us today. But the second thing and the second reason we wanted to continually go back into it, because today, uh, if you're just joining us and this is your first time here, we haven't been in the book of Acts since January of 2015. Okay, we, we've come into it, we've picked it up, we've set it down again, we've looked at it thematically, we've, we've gone into it four or five different times now. And the reason we went back to it and brought it up as a reminder is because it's about the mission of the church. And we want to be reminded, I wanted us to be reminded, about what our mission is, what we're doing, what we should be striving for, where we're going. And it's a book about church planting and spreading the gospel. And if the gospel can move from Jerusalem to Rome in that first century, within that one generation, then what could God do in our midst here today? Now this summer, we've been looking at it through a particular lens. And that lens is through this lens of staying the course. Paul is done with his missionary journeys. He's done with his church planting. And now he feels this call to get to the city of Rome. That's going to be the end of the book. He wants to get to the city of Rome. And so over the last seven or eight chapters, he's been on this journey trying to get from where he was, where he started this summer. He was in the city of Ephesus, and he had to go through Jerusalem and ultimately get to the city of Rome. And so he was, we followed him along that journey, and he had obstacles hurdles, people telling him, don't do this, don't, don't go there, you're going to get arrested, it's not going to go well for you, but he stayed the course, and so we want to know why, what was it that motivated him and gave him the confidence to keep going? Now, maybe in your life, there's something that you are staying the course on. You know, we have said maybe it's not something as big as Paul's call to go to Rome, but there's probably something that you're wrestling with that you feel God calling you to do, moving you forward. Maybe it's a career change. Maybe it's buying a house or moving. Maybe it's trying to discover whether you should marry your significant other. Maybe it's discovering what school you should go to. Should you continue your education? Should you not continue it? But whatever it is, there's something in your life that you probably feel God calling you to do. And you might think, well, that's not nearly as important as what Paul did. And maybe it's not. But we feel, and I believe, that we can apply the same principles, big or small, the same things that were true of Paul as a follower of Jesus Christ are true for us. Now today what we're going to see finally is we're going to see Paul's mission completed. And here's why that's going to matter to us, because what I want us to take away from this text is not just that at some point this thing that you're staying the course on may be completed, because it, it will be. That, that you stay the course, trusting for completion, looking for completion, kind of asking yourself the question, when's this job going to be done? But what I want us to hear is not that it will be completed, but how you can be confident that it will be completed. How can you be sure, how does Paul's story make us certain that we can keep pressing on forward to that goal? Because there's nothing more frustrating than being in the middle of staying the course and not knowing if you'll ever reach your destination. You can go through situations here, some of these maybe 
have come from the lives of the people in this church. They've certainly come from my life. Things like uh, a couple deciding we want to be parents. And then trying to become parents and dealing with fertility issues. And at first you go, oh, this will be fine. But then it becomes two years or three years and you go, will this ever happen for us? How can we be confident? How can we stay the course? And that's when we need the courage and the reminder to stick with it. We reach a certain age and we've been trying to find somebody to marry. We want to get married, but everybody we meet is a dud. We think, what do we, how do we keep going forward? Do I keep pressing forward to this call that I feel God has on my life? We want to change careers, but we can't find another job that will pay us what we feel we, we need to make. We want to buy a house, but we live in North Jersey. And we find that I can't afford one for another 20 or 30 years. You go, how do, you, how do you stay the course? What gives you the confidence to keep pressing on even when you're in the midst of it? And that's what we're going to see today in this story. So if you have Acts, uh, if you have your Bible open, Acts chapter 28, we're going to start in verse 11. Now, if you remember, when we left Paul last, he had been shipwrecked on the island of Malta, this little tiny island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, he had been spared from death. All of the other uh, sailors and prisoners on the ship with him were spared from death. And so they ended up having to winter on the island of Malta because you couldn't travel in the Mediterranean Sea during uh, the periods of like mid-November to mid-February. So they, were, they tried to beat the storms, got caught in a storm, their ship gets wrecked, they end up on the island of Malta and they have to stay there for three months. And now the travel season is opened back up again and they're getting ready to go. In verse 11, after three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting it at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Putioli. Putioli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of Rome. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to the sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and to trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen." He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. When Luke sums up this chapter, Acts 28, and what we find in these last few verses is that this really is the culmination of everything that we've been studying in the book of Acts this far. That, that everything we've been looking at, everything we've seen, the patterns that we've examined, they're all coming to a head right here in this final chapter. That everything we've talked about is, is right here and again affirmed for us. And you can see that by looking at the story and seeing a couple of details about it. Because as you often see, and as is so often the case, Luke's story uh, is only intended to reveal the story underneath the story. That there's more going on. His record of the details are calling us to consider why things are the way that they are. And so we find here 
Finally, after 28 chapters of the church moving from Jerusalem to Rome, verse 14 sums up chapter 28 this way. And so we came to Rome. So let's consider first the church of Rome. There were already Christians there when they got there. As Paul and his companions are traveling up the coast, they land in a port city, uh, the port city of Puteoli, and then they go and they walk up their way to get to Rome, and as they're going to Rome, they find that there's already Christians there. That's not the first time that we've seen that in the city of Rome. We earlier found out in the book of Acts, maybe you remember these two people, Priscilla and Aquila, leaders in the church who Paul met in Corinth, and Priscilla and Aquila were Christians who came from Rome. So we know that somehow the gospel had already reached the city of Rome before Paul even got there. That it wasn't just within one generation that the gospel got there, but it was quick. That there was already a established and solid group of Christian people living in Rome. That it wasn't just a few of them, but there's this, there's this organized thing. And so uh, we know that Paul had already written to the believers in Rome, in a book that we call Romans. He says right at the beginning that he wants to go and visit them. So he wrote them before he arrived, and when he got there, uh, they would know who he was. But what's important for us to understand is that there's no record of any apostle going to Rome. Like, there's later speculation that maybe it was Peter who went to Rome and established a church there. That's what the Catholic Church believes, uh, based on some later documents. But there's really no solid evidence to say or demonstrate that any of the apostles or any professional missionary ever actually went to Rome and started a church. There's just no record of it. And so the likeliest scenario of why the gospel had already reached the city of Rome and why there were already Christians living there was that it was everyday Christians who had heard the gospel in some city they passed through, became Christians, and went home and started a church in the city of Rome. That that the reason that the gospel moved in one generation from Jerusalem to Rome was because everyday Christians, not professional Christians, Not ministers, not pastors, but it was everyday Christians who took the gospel back to their neighborhoods and started a church. And that's how the gospel spread so fast. And if you look at it, that's the only reason that it would make it there. Uh, It wasn't about a single professional with all the answers. It wasn't about people hired to do a job and everyone else could take the day off. The apostles and the preachers were given to the church to guide the church. The majority of Paul's work was really correcting the theology in the church and making sure that it didn't go widely off the rails. But by and large, it was the everyday believers, Christians sitting in the pews, attending the house churches that were taking the gospel out and starting new churches. And that's the only way it spreads. Because for most of the book of Acts, we've been following the professional ministry of Paul. And he's been talking about, I want to get to Rome. I want to start churches. I want to get there. I want to get there. We've been following his story. He's been held up. He hasn't been able to make it. Like if the gospel reaching Rome was dependent on Paul getting to Rome, it wouldn't have gotten there for another 10 or 15 years after it actually arrived. That just by everyday people spreading the gospel, sharing the gospel, it spread like lightning across the Roman Empire. And the the apostles were playing catch up. Like they couldn't even get there fast enough. That's the way that the gospel spreads. The gospel, you know, Paul's really moving. But despite that pace, despite the frequency that he's starting new churches, the crowdsourced movement has outpaced him. He could never keep up with it. When everyday people who follow Christ get inspired to spread the message of Christ. It spreads like wildfire. That's the first thing we have to see. That's the detail under the detail. That's Paul, you know, Luke's like, well, we arrived in Rome and all of these Christians came out to meet us before we even got there. Well, the point is, there's already Christians in Rome. They've already gotten there. Second thing we need to see, though, it's not just that there's Christians there, but the second kind of detail under the story that Luke gives us, but we have to think about a little bit, is Paul's reputation. You know, it's kind of interesting what happens here. On the one hand, the Christians all know who he is and run out to greet him. So they had either heard about him, received his letter as a group of churches, whatever it was, but you don't run out to someone you've never met, particularly if they're currently arrested and under Roman guard. But they run out anyway. They find out that Paul's coming. They run out to meet him. But on the flip side, the Jewish leaders have no idea who he is. They they, they go, oh, we've... That's, yeah, we've never heard of you. And, and he, to his credit, he calls him to the house he's staying at, and the first thing he does, he's like, okay, guys, look, i got to set the record straight. Uh, here's what's been happening. You know, I, gotta, I, I didn't, don't think I did anything wrong, but I got arrested by the Jewish leaders in Rome. 
I was handed over to the Romans. I appealed to Caesar. That's why I'm here. Just want to give you guys a heads up, tell you my side of the story. And they're like, we've never heard of you. We have no idea who you are. There's been people coming here from Jerusalem. They haven't written about you. They haven't told us about you. Nobody's mentioned you. Now, I don't know if that's divine intervention, because if the Jewish religious leaders in Rome had known about him, they could have caused a lot of problems for Paul. I don't know if it was the result of embarrassment. The church, the Jewish synagogues that were in Rome would have been underneath the rule of the Jewish synagogues in Jerusalem. It was kind of home base. And so maybe the church in Jerusalem didn't want to let them know that they had this kind of big problem. Maybe they didn't want them to know because we see the religious leaders and they say, hey, we don't know who you are, but nobody talks well about the Christians. We know what we've heard about this sect. Nobody likes you. Nobody wants you, they say to Paul. They say, so we know about the Christians. We know what's happening. We don't know about you, though, so tell us about that. So maybe the Jews in Jerusalem, they didn't want to let them know that, oh, man, this is kind of on us. Like, yeah, we actually, we trained this guy. Yeah, he was one of our guys, and then he went rogue, and he became a believer, and next thing you know, the, the church has spread all the way to Rome. Maybe they didn't want to let him know, but whatever the case, Paul gets there. The Christians know him. The Jewish leaders have no idea who he is, but they say, but tell us the story. Tell us what you believe. Tell us what it means to be a Christian. Because everything we've heard says, nobody likes you people. Now, of course, they're probably just talking about the religious Jewish people that don't like the Christians. But they say, tell us about it. And that's the story underneath the story. So Acts 28 stands as a picture of completion. Paul completes his assignment to get to Rome. He stays, to, he stays the course. And that's what Acts 28 represents, that, he, that he's arrived, that he's done it, that sticking the course out, staying, you know, moving through all the obstacles, the hurdles, he finally has arrived. And now, uh, one more time, in the central city of the empire, Paul does what he's done in every other city that he's been to. He starts with the Jews, he shares the good news with them, and then when they reject him, he brings it to the Gentiles. And everything in the book of Acts has been leading us up to this moment. It points to the reality of this completion, that Paul has stayed the course, and now that he's completed the journey, and, and now in a, on the bigger scale, the advance of the kingdom of God has done what Jesus has said it would do. When he said in the very first chapter of Acts, he said, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And now, as we look at this, we see it has arrived at the ends of the earth. That in one generation, it has done what Jesus says. And so, what do we learn about staying the course? And, and how do we stay the course? How do we have the confidence to know that if God has called you to something, He will complete it? That if God has called you forward, He will protect you? All of these things that we've brought up, the whole, that we've talked about, God's protection, God's purposes, and all of this, but how can we be sure? And so we look at what's revealed in this passage. And the first thing, and I've said it every week, but in different ways. You have to see God's plan. You have to look for God's plan. You can't stay the course unless it's God's plan. Now see, for a lot of people, that becomes sort of restrictive. Because we start thinking to ourselves, well, if what I'm doing is God's plan, then, then, or isn't God's plan, then how do I know whether I should be doing it or not? And so we don't want to do anything. Because well, I have to figure out if it's God's plan first before I do it, and then we just end up not moving at all. But what I'd suggest is that the understanding that it's God's plan in your life moving you forward is actually supposed to be freeing. It's supposed to be less restrictive. Instead of being concerned that what we're doing isn't God's plan, we should be confident that it is. And if it's not, he's going to show us. Because the central thing we've been seeing ever since Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 God's plan will proceed the way he intends it to proceed. That God's plan will be fulfilled. Now, sometimes it's true, God's not really clear about what his plan is. And we talked about last week, it would be a lot easier if God just popped down, sent an angel or something, and was like, hey, here's what I want you to do. But it doesn't usually happen that way. But in areas where we're not sure whether what we're doing is God's will, you and I, as believers in Christ, can have the confidence to say, as long as I'm trying to do God's will, as long as God's will is something that matters to me, then even if I'm not really sure what that will is at any given moment, I can trust that he won't let me get outside of it. 
That the Christian has the confidence of knowing that if we are following God and seeking to follow God with our lives, then we can be confident that he will not let us get outside of his plan. That he will continue moving us forward. Now, there's sort of the negative view of this, a, the, sort of a way of stating it negatively, which is to say if we, that since we can't thwart God's plan, since we can't ruin God's plan, we don't have to worry about it. But there's a positive way of saying it this, and it's that if this is God's plan, if what you're doing in your life is God's plan, if God is moving, if he is walking you forward, then you won't fail. Then you will come to completion, that the job will be finished. And so that's why, as I'm looking at this passage, the very last thing that Luke, reco- Luke records, Paul saying, is like dropping a bomb. I mean, the, the last thing he says, if you take verse 30 and 31 as an epilogue, to kind of like, okay, here's what happened after that, the very last recorded statement in the book of Acts is Paul looking at the Jews who had essentially rejected his teaching, And they've rejected Christ, and he looks at them, and the very last statement in the book of Acts is he goes, listen, I'm going to take the book of Isaiah. You've read the book before. You know what Isaiah is telling you. You're going to keep on hearing but never understand. You're going to keep on seeing, but you're not going to perceive. You're going to harden your hearts toward God, and as a result, you will never turn, and you will never be healed by him. And here's the big one. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Story's over. That's the end of the story. I mean, Luke's like, now here's what happened after that. But, Luke, but the big thing, the, the whole chapter, the whole book starts out in the book of Jerusalem with God's plan being Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And now here we are, the very last thing. And Paul says, what Jesus has predicted has happened. You have rejected him, but the Gentiles will receive their faith. And, he, and that's what you see. It encapsulates the entirety of the book of Acts. The book of Acts that begins in Jerusalem, the capital city of the Jews. And it ends in Rome, the capital city of the Gentiles. That's not an accident. That's what the whole story has been about. That God is blessing the nations through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And at the end of the book, just like God has always said, the message will be ignored by the Jews and received by the Gentiles. If Paul's journey to completion is over, if he's stayed the course, the only reason that it eventually concludes is because he knows this was God's plan all along. That he proceeds with confidence, knowing if God has called me to this, then we will press forward. And like I said, some people object and they say, well, if God's plan is going to happen anyway, then I don't really have to try. If God's plan is going to carry itself out in your life, then what does it matter what you do? Just do whatever you want. And that's the objection that some people will raise. But the answer is actually no. And this passage shows it to us. If we have stayed the course and we've arrived at completion, it's not just because of God's plan, although that was the thing that secures it. It was also because of Paul's faithfulness. It's God's plan and it's Paul's faithfulness. Paul fully understood God's call on his life. He understands God's plan. He understood that he was to bring the gospel to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, and he has the confidence to know that if God has said it, if God has ordained it, then it will come to pass. But what that led him to was greater faithfulness, not less. To more work for the kingdom, not less. Continued obedience, not less. To the point that even when he discovers that the Jewish leaders in Rome don't even know who he is, he tells them the truth anyway. He could have been like, oh, you, got, you guys, you haven't heard of me? Oh, well then, never mind. It's, yeah, I'm Jewish too. Cool. Just gotten out of it. No, no, no. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, believe me, I'm on the up and up. There's some misunderstanding. No, when, when he, even when he finds out they don't know who he is, he's like, oh, well, let me tell you about what got me in trouble. And he goes right into it again. Well, let me tell you the gospel. You know that Jesus? Yeah, he was crucified. Remember him? You guys didn't like him. He's my savior. And, and he just, He's faithful. Because he knew that God's plan was there. That was the thing that secured it, but it was the thing that brought him to the point of being faithful. He presses on. He shares the good news. He stays the course. He keeps doing what God has called him to do. So that when we read that epilogue in verse 30 and 31, he writes this, Paul lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul stays faithful. He doesn't give up. He keeps moving forward. 
And staying the course, it's what it requires. You see, so when we start thinking about staying the course, I reminded us that whether staying the course in our lives is something big or something small, the same principles apply. And that's been true with almost everything we've talked about in this series, including what we're talking about today. How do, how do you stay the course? What gives you the confidence to keep staying the course? And, and maybe part of our question is, well, when do we know when I can stop? When do I know when I can, like, okay, I'm done with this. When do I, when, can I just stop now? And there's a simple answer. Well, you can stop when the job is done. You can stop when you get to where God has been calling you. You can stop when you've completed the assignment. And for Paul, that was to go to Rome. There was a specific, measurable calling that he knew, that he felt, and he followed and stayed the course with, even when circumstances or advice told him not to. And some of the things that we talked about in your life, if, I, if you feel God calling you to have children, then how do you know when you've completed that assignment? When you've had children. If God is calling you to find a home in the area and purchase it, how do you know when you've done that? When you've closed on your house. If God is calling you to change careers, how do you know when you've done it, when you've changed careers? There are certain things, certain callings that are measurable and defined, and you'll know they're completed when you have completed it. When the job is done and you are aware that it's done, and you can see that it's done and it's measurable. But in another sense, when we're talking about staying the course, what I hope will happen for all of us is that our view of what that means will be broadened. That we won't just think about the specific measurable things in our life, but we'll think about the broader call. Because for Paul, getting to Rome was just one step, but it was part of a much larger call. And it was one that wasn't going to be completed. And that's the reason that the book of Acts is, it's just open-ended. Like if you're reading the narrative and you see all that's happened and you see Luke's account of the last seven or eight chapters and then all of a sudden, boom, there in Rome, the story's over. Nothing else, we don't know what happens to Paul. There's speculation, there's historical research. Where did Paul go? What, you know, there's, in, in all likelihood, he went to Spain and completed another missionary journey to Spain before eventually getting killed by the Emperor Nero. It's possible that he was killed by the Emperor Nero during this stay, depending on when the time was. But, but we don't, like Luke would have known, but he didn't even tell us. He doesn't conclude Paul's story, his journey. He concludes that portion, Paul had to get to Rome. And then he says, and then he just went on preaching the gospel. Because there's a sense in which this one measurable thing was completed, but overall, Paul's mission wasn't completed. That he had to stay the course. That he had to keep going. Paul arrived in Rome, but the world was hardly converted. There were more people who needed to hear. Again, he stays there for the two years that are indicated, and then maybe he went on. So even though individual assignments might have completed, the overall work that he was called to, to be a witness, it just never stopped. And that's why I said since the very beginning that the history recorded in this story is our story. It's our story. We're supposed to be continuing it on. The book of Acts doesn't end because the church doesn't end. Luke doesn't complete it because there's no, there's no end of the story. Like you are part of this. We are still writing chapters of the book of Acts. That God is still moving through his church. That God is still, God, we are still proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. We are still preaching the word of God. We are still doing all these things. The church of Jesus Christ is still expanding into areas that it had not previously been into. The book of Acts continues. And so we continue to press forward and advance the gospel in whatever context we find ourselves so that the kingdom of God and the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ continues with with all boldness and without hindrance, that we don't stop. And so we might think about our individual assignments and go, how do we know when we're done? And the answer would be, when the work is completed. But the book of Acts is supposed to raise up our vision and our view of what we're called to do in the world. Look at the bigger picture of kingdom advance in the world and make us ask the question, when is the work done? When do we stop staying the course? And the answer is still the same. When the work is completed, But ultimately, the answer is when Jesus returns. When do you stop staying the course in your life? When do you stop staying the course of kingdom advancement? When do you get to hit pause? When do you get to go, you know what, I don't want to be a Christian for a little while. When do you get to say, man, this is really hard. Like everything I go through, whether I go through suffering or tragedy or hurdles or obstacles or good times or bad times, when do you get to stop and say, I I think I'm just done? 
The answer is you don't. Not until Jesus comes back. It's not just our individual call. It's not just our specific assignment. It's in this great big call of the church to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Stay the course. Stay true to God's plan. Stay faithful. And one day, Christ will return. Let's pray. Father, we are reminded now in closing of this book what you, your son, told us at the beginning. That we will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We're reminded that he said you will be with us to the end of the age. That we are reminded that he will return the same way in which he left. And that our work between now and then is for kingdom advancement, to stay true to God's plan, to be faithful. Be with us, Lord, in your name.